All right, Mike, if you want to introduce yourself, uh, the floor is yours. Great. Thanks a lot, Eric. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Mike Roque. I'm here to uh, give a chat or a clinic today on operations. Uh, I'm sort of honored here as a longtime member of OPSIG and a fan of operations in general, and of course, a lifelong model railroader to give this talk. So uh, thank you for having me today. And looks like we've got a pretty good amount of turnout today. So I appreciate that. Um, we're here to talk about operations on the Sierra Central Railroad. This is the H of scale layout at the Sacramento Model Railroad Historical Society in Sacramento, California. I am the operations manager, uh, which means I basically make operating sessions happen. <clears throat> I've been sort of doing that for about three or four years here. Well, it's about five or six years now, I suppose. Uh, but I've always been interested in operations and it has been the core of the hobby for me. I've been a big fan. Uh, short bio on me. I originally grew up in New York City. Uh, I grew up sort of riding the subways in Metro North and that sort of thing. I ended up moving up to Rochester, New York to go to college at RIT, where I met a lot of my rail fan and model railroad friends, uh, many of which I'm still friends with today, uh, several decades later. And now I live in Sacramento, California, uh, where the weather is warm and the trains are plentiful. So um, <laughs> I've really enjoyed my, my journey west and my journey into really deeply understanding railroad operations. Um, today's talk is going to be about uh, specifically model railroad operations on our layout. I do several other talks on railroad signaling and CTC machines and a variety of other uh, what I call sub interests or sub hobbies, as we all have in this hobby. Uh, but today we're going to talk about ops on the Sierra Central. So um, we've only got about an hour, so I'm going to get right to it. Um, I assume everybody can see my screen. So let's talk about what we're going to talk about. Um, I'm going to give you a little layout overview or an overview of our layout, I should say, so you understand the context in which we're operating. Um, I don't have the exact numbers off the top of my head, but it's about, I think, about a 60 by 30, 60 by 40. It's a fairly, I would say, a medium sized club size layout. Um, so we'll take a look at that. Uh, we'll talk about some goals and challenges. What is it that we're actually trying to achieve? through our operating session design and what are the challenges or the obstacles to meeting those goals. Um, then we'll talk about uh, job aids. How do we actually communicate the information that our operators need to be successful and uh, presumably have a good time. Um, and then we'll deal with the nitty gritty. You know, how do we actually operate a railroad? What does a railroad do? This audience, I think, has a fairly good grasp of at least the basic concepts there, but we'll talk about it in a general way so we can think about it uh, in a broader context. And then we'll look at the actual specific jobs that we use to um, implement those types of trains and basically make the op session happen. So that's kind of an overview. Let's uh, move right into it. Um, this is kind of our signature photo from a photo shoot that we did some years ago. Uh, so many years ago, I don't remember how long ago it was, but uh, this is one of the signature scenes on our layout in Davis, California. There's a, an old sort of um, mission style depot that still stands there today. Um, there's some signals there, there's a, a short line that operates the, uh, the connection to a, what you can't really see here, there's a Y there at Davis. But if you're in the area or if you're ever coming to California, it's kind of a neat spot to check out. But this photo kind of encapsulates our, our approach to high quality model railroading and the interpretation of history, specifically railroad history, uh, but in general history of California and railroads through model railroading. Um, so this is a, <clears throat> kind of our favorite photo. You'll see this on our website as well over at smrhs.com. So let's talk about our layout. Um, basically our layout models Northern California circa 1960, which is uh, early enough that we can still justify running some steam and late enough that we can run some stuff that came a little bit later. Uh, diesels and uh, some things that weren't quite around in the, in the heyday of steam or in the, in the 50s. So we have a two deck layout. <clears throat> we'll talk about that specifically in a second. But basically, we model the Southern Pacific between Oakland and Sacramento, the Cal P, as it's known out here, the California Pacific line um, on the lower deck. And on the upper deck, we model the Western Pacific between Sacramento and Keddie uh, via the Feather River Canyon route. Um, California's two major railroads here, most modelers uh, or many modelers in the area are interested in those two railroads, and I imagine that was why we decided to pick those two. Uh, the design is multi-deck, walk around, sort of a modern style layout. Uh, the lower deck uh, from an operating standpoint or a characteristic standpoint is double track. We've got directional uh, ABS uh, on the lower deck um, in a larger implementation of CTC on the entire layout. And on the upper deck, uh, the topology is more single track with passing sidings, which would be be more akin to the Western Pacific's 
you know, uh, facilities and so forth. It's about 600 foot of main line. We've got loops at both ends. So when we're not having a, an operating session, we can have easy, fun, continuous running without having to turn trains or deal with a stub ended yard, that sort of thing. Um, our general max train length, uh, which is to say our, our shortest siding is about 24, 40 foot cars plus an engine and caboose. Um, our main passing siding on the upper deck is uh, almost double that, but um, as a matter of practice, we find it's better to limit our max train length to the smallest siding, which is uh, next to it, so that we never have to worry about whether people can fit or whether a train can fit in our shortest siding. Um, we've got a staging yard at either end, east and west. Uh, Oakland Desert Yard is the west end. Uh, if you're familiar with California, that's kind of the big yard there in the Bay Area, on the, what's now the UP. Um, and then Ketty, uh, we call it the Ketty AD yard at the east end of the railroad, which represents uh, at Ketty, California, the line kind of splits to go north up to the Pacific Northwest and east towards Salt Lake City. So that yard kind of represents points east and points north, uh, just like any staging yard would. It's sort of the rest of the world, right? And we've got sort of two major classification yards, or I'd say a major class yard and a minor class yard. Uh, being that we're here in Sacramento, we've focused on Sacramento. So our 12th Street yard is sort of a major class yard. I think it's about 12 tracks uh, off the top of my head. Um, with you know, a turntable and uh, shops and some other ancillary uh, areas. We also have a passenger station, which is uh, about the same size. But in terms of classification and operations, uh, 12th Street Yard is the big one there. And then up at Ketty, we have a smaller class yard where uh, traffic gets sorted for east and north uh, outbound, in other words, going into staging. And then those trains that are arriving from those directions get reclassified into new outbound trains from Ketty. And we'll see that in a little bit more detail when we look at the actual track plan in just a second. But uh, for those of you keeping score, the towns that we uh, model include West Oakland, Oakland Pier, Martinez, Davis, Sacramento, uh, sort of the major towns along the way between Oakland in Sacramento, and then just basically going right up the old Western Pacific into the canyon, Marysville, Oroville. Um, Poe is not really a town, but it is a station on the line that is of some significance. And of course, Ketty uh, was where there was a yard and engine facilities. And so that's kind of the main focus there. But we also have a branch line to Quincy. And we also model an area that right now is uh, implemented as Reno. But we're actually going to change that over to Crescent Mills uh, pretty soon, which is sort of more geographically appropriate being right near Ketty rather than sort of Reno over there. But it's Reno for the moment. And those are the towns on our layout. So let's Take a look at the track plan here. This is available on our website if you want to take a look, if you keep in score at home um, at smrhs.com. But over here on the left is the lower level. Uh, if we start over here in Desert Yard, this is kind of the west end of the railroad in Oakland. Uh, we also model the Oakland Pier. Uh, so we've got some uh, industrial switching there and a passenger terminal there, basically the Oakland Mole, if you're familiar with that, the passenger terminal out on a um, peninsula that jutted out into uh, into the bay. Um, and if we come around from Oakland here, you'll see West Oakland's kind of an industrial area with several customers. We have an interchange with the Oakland Terminal Railway here and a few customers. Over here in Martinez, we've got a, a tank car customer for uh, you know, the refineries that are in that area, plywood customer, and uh, basically some team tracks here. Uh, also a passenger depot. And if we continue eastward, uh, we'll be along San Pablo Bay, come into Bahia and Davis across the Yolo Causeway, um, which gets you from basically Davis to Sacramento over uh, a, uh, a river bypass, a flood bypass, a floodplain. Uh, into Micon and into Sacramento Passenger Depot here, this whole area along the top um, is going to be, is, a, is I should say, is a passenger terminal, platforms, that sort of thing, small uh, freight yard, express traffic, that sort of thing. And the, the centerpiece of this area is the actual Sacramento SP shops, which we've uh, modeled in uh, almost uh, exact uh, scale. Not exactly, we had to do just a little bit of selective compression to make it fit in here, but it's, it's basically uh, a scale model of the area. And then of course, 12th Street is our major class yard. You can see the, the top half here is sort of the receiving yard and then the class tracks over here. We've got some rip tracks and locomotive servicing facilities, caboose track. Um, come back around here, of course, the main line, uh, though I should say the main tracks bypass the yard here, come around uh, into, it's on, this is an old diagram, it says globe, but we call it Hagen now. Um, basically, we have a connection, this green area you see here is uh, downtown Sacramento has an area called R Street, uh, which was an industrial switching district that was operated by both the SP and the WP, and uh, really represents sort of uh, the early 
time of railroading in Sacramento. One of the first lines out of Sacramento there to Folsom ran down our street, uh, one of the earliest uh, West Coast railroads. I believe the earliest actually, first in the West. Um, then we continue through Del Paso here is where we go uh, from double track to single track. Uh, and then basically this track is a long ramp along the back wall. It's kind of hidden behind a backdrop starting about here. And we come up to the second deck or the upper deck uh, where we pass by Marysville, which is essentially sort of a branch line, practically speaking, um, from Oroville here. You can see where the, uh, the Sacramento Northern would have crossed the Western Pacific is kind of what we're going for. And of course, interchange here. Oroville is kind of the major industrial area on the upper deck. Uh, also, this is our long passing siding here. You can see that's probably about, oh gosh, 20 feet long, something like that. And we come up and around through Poe and into the Feather River Canyon. So from this curve to Ketty is a uh, high steep mountain scenery, um, no customers obviously. And this is that short siding I mentioned earlier. This is our smallest siding, it's about 24 cars long. Uh, at Poe there, small customer, I should say, spot for uh, gravel loading and maintenance away, that sort of thing. And then we come up into the famous Ketty Wine, uh, whose real name is Spanish Creek Trestle for the, for the hardcore fans, but it's sort of known internationally as Ketty Wine. It's a big Y on a, <clears throat> on a trestle, um, and it goes over Spanish Creek, hence Spanish Creek Trestle. And then along the back wall here, we have Ketty Yard. You can see there's about three stub tracks here, and I think it's three through tracks. Uh, we have a depot track uh, against the wall here, it's where the uh, passenger trains call, uh, that sort of thing. Um, turntable, small roundhouse. And over here is the Quincy branch in purple, uh, small industrial switching district. Um, and then the interchange yard, or I should say the AD yard, the arrival departure yard. I, referenced earlier, it's just three long stub tracks that we use to originate uh, westbound trains, of course. And then over here is that Reno area, similar to West Oakland, kind of an industrial switching district. And um, we're going to make some minor changes here and uh, actually implement it as Crescent Mills, which was just outside of Ketty and a little bit more relevant uh, as far as the Western Pacific's operations were concerned. So that's an overview of the layout. Let's talk about goals and challenges. Um, this is a, this is one of my favorite pictures that I've ever taken in model railroading, and certainly at this uh, at this uh, club is um, when before I took over as the operations manager, um, our operating sessions, you know, essentially in some cases required an operator kind of sit around and wait for something to happen, and. Uh, one day, uh, this member was was operating the uh, West Oakland switcher job here uh, and was obviously sort of bored here and didn't have much to do waiting for a train to show up and uh, drop off cars uh, for West Oakland and pick up uh, any outbounds in that direction. And so this is kind of what we want to avoid, right? We, we don't want to be bored, right? The whole point of an op session is to do stuff and, and have fun. But let's talk about that. Let's talk about what those goals actually are. Um, for me, and I think for most of us, uh, fun is goal number one, right? We're not here to be bored. We're not here to have a job. We're here to have a good time with, with, with friends, right? So how do we define that? Um, I like to define that as, as realistic, realistic jobs of, of various lengths and difficulty levels, right? Not everybody is a hardcore operator. Not everybody is at the same skill level. Um, you have people coming and going in a club environment. In other words, it's not necessarily the same people all the time. Um, so we want to have a variety of jobs that are realistic. We also want to go to work right away. Uh, there's nothing worse than going to an op session and not have anything to do for the first you know, a few minutes or hours of the session. Um, so one of one of my personal goals is to make sure that all operators have something to do right away. And uh, along with that, as the person who, uh, let's call, produces the operating session, um, I want to have the minimal amount of staging or preparation for each session. We hold sessions every month on the first Friday. And so, you know, it, it gets to be, I don't want to use the word chore, that's too strong a word, it gets to be a task, an ongoing responsibility for somebody to prepare for these. And when I first joined up is we were spending four or five hours staging the railroad for a two to three hour op session. I don't think that's fun. So I think minimizing staging and preparation is, is an important uh, you know, part of having fun. Um, along with that, we want to be prototypically accurate, right? I mean, the whole point of model railroading is to simulate the real thing. 
once you get beyond sort of Brio and Lionel trains and the basics, you know, you get into wanting to really simulate the real thing. Uh, and the way I would define that is through purposeful and plausible car and train movements. We want to do it just like the real thing for the same reason. I mean, we don't want to just move stuff around arbitrarily. That can be fun too, but when we're talking about obsessions and prototypical accuracy, we, we've got to have purpose. We've got to have a reason for what we're doing. Um, along with that, we want things to be era appropriate. We want our rolling stock to make sense. We don't want to have steam engines pulling auto racks or, you know, uh, brand new locomotives pulling, you know, 40 foot box cars. That sort of thing. Same thing with our scenery and our operating practices. Um, we have the actual Western Pacific Railroad CTC machine, the original machine, the real machine from Sacramento, the lever machine. Um, so we want to use that because that's what was what would have been in use at the time, uh, as opposed to say radios and you know, so track warrants or something like that, uh, or some modern operating practice, you know, a digicon system, that sort of thing. And the practices, we want to do it the way the real railroads did it at the time. Um, for us, that means a dispatcher radio and CTC signals. Again, that's what, what they would have used at the time. Um, and then efficiency. We, we want to have fun because we, you know, we, we, the, the way to have fun is to minimize traffic related train delays, right? We don't want to be sitting in the siding waiting for trains to go by to the degree possible. We want to be running trains. Not that it never happens and that it's not fun once in a while, but we don't want to be sitting in the siding for hours at a time, that sort of thing. Um, along with that, we need to prevent yards and towns from getting clogged. We don't want uh, our main class yard to get overwhelmed. Uh, when that happens, the whole railroad generally comes to a stop. I think most of you, have, I'm, sure, I'm sure we've all experienced that at one point or another. Yards get overwhelmed and then everything else backs up from there. Um, and then along with the accuracy, we also want to make sure cars get to their destination. And I put eventually in quotes here, we'll talk about that in a little more detail. As long as they get there eventually um, via the minimum number of jobs and trains, then we can have that efficiency. We don't want more jobs than necessary because that will take more crew members. And we obviously want to make sure cars get to their destination because that's the point. That's kind of the whole point of railroading, right? A to B. Um, so those are the goals. Uh, let's have fun. Let's do it the right way and, you know, the way the real railroads did it. And let's do it efficiently. Let's do it as easily and simply as we can. Uh, but we've got some challenges, of course, right? Nothing's perfectly easy uh, when it comes to our operators. As I mentioned earlier, um, we have wide variations. We have people who come and go over time through our club. And at any given moment, uh, any given op session, I should say, we may have, you know, 12 operators. We may have 18. Uh, we may have eight, that sort of thing. It, it varies wildly uh, or it can vary wildly. Um, similarly, um, not everybody has the same level of skill, experience, or even interest for that matter. Some folks just want to run the passenger train and have a good time. And some folks don't feel good about themselves until they've switched 50 cars over three hours <laughs> and everything in between. Um, we also may have folks who are not familiar with the geography that we're modeling. Some folks are from out of town. Some folks, uh, you know, not everybody knows as much as anybody else about a particular rail. You might be a Western Pacific fan and you don't know about the SP or vice versa, that sort of thing. Um, so people may not know that, you know, Ketty is east of Sacramento. You know, Davis is, uh, you know, Martinez is west of Davis or wherever it might be. So we have to we have to meet those challenges for our operators. Uh, also with the layout, uh, you notice our staging yards, we've got about, we'll talk about this in more detail in a sec, but our Oakland staging yard at the West End has got much more capacity than our Ketty staging yard at the East, right? How do we deal with that, right? We can't just run the same number of trains in both directions, for example, we just won't have enough room, it won't work out, or at least you'll have to uh, run light power and uh, move some things around to, uh, to balance it out. So what do we do about that, right? Uh, engine and train turn. Right. Uh, fortunately, we have loops at either end, but um, we need to have the right engines and the right trains in the right places facing the right direction, that sort of thing. Um, so that's an issue or that can be an issue. Um, and then just the main tracks capacity at the end of the day. Um, you know, my personal rule of thumb, generally speaking, you can run about as many trains as you have sidings plus one. Um, it's sort of scales up a little bit differently than that. But that's the basic idea, right? You can't run uh, a train in every section of main track, single track and siding and all of that and expect anything to move. At some point, uh, things tend to bog down. So uh, the main track is usually the most uh, valuable resource uh, in terms of scarcity. And we need to account for that in our operations as well. Um, and lastly, we'll talk about traffic flow. 
Um, we've got, I think it's somewhere in the neighborhood of about 250 cars on the layout. And what we want to make sure is that they're all sort of roughly evenly distributed, right? We don't want cars piling up at the east end and then piling up at the west end or, you know, too many cars, uh, you know, in one place and not enough where they need to be, that sort of thing. As I alluded to earlier, we also need to concern ourselves with uh, east-west engine train or uh, engine balance, right? If we run two trains west and one train east, well, sooner or later, we're going to run out of locomotives in the east and we'll have to run some back from the west, uh, how do we how do we deal with that, right? Uh, same thing with trains. Uh, what you find is that uh, you want to balance that out from east to west, roughly, um, so that um, you know we don't we don't have those imbalances. And again, uh, our towns, uh, more specifically, uh, we can only fit so many cars in so many spots, and there's only so many places you can place a car on a railroad. Um, so we need to manage that as part of our operating session design as well. So, you know, challenges again, include our operators, the layout itself and the traffic flow and traffic patterns. So let's talk about job aids. Let's talk about how we actually communicate what it is that we want our crews to do. I think everybody's pretty familiar with this stuff, um, but uh, here's uh, Steve Foligno, our actual treasurer. So I think this is an old shot from about four or five years ago and he's working at Ketty Yard there classifying cars and, uh, you know, uh, we, we use car card and way bills. And I think you guys are pretty familiar with that. So I'm not going to get too much into that. But here's just a list of the job aids. And we'll go into all of these in a little bit of detail. We have a call board, which is basically our standing jobs, like our dispatchers, our yard masters, um, and our local trains. And uh, then we also have a road train lineup that we use as a road pool. So if you're not on any of those jobs, you just basically run road trains in a sequence. We'll look at that in more detail in just a moment. Um, we also have a yard train departure sheet for each yard so that the yard masters know what trains they have to build uh, or what trains depart from their yard. They don't necessarily have to build every train. Let's say a local comes in, if that local's got a uh, block that needs to be uh, you know, uh, a set of cars that need to be blocked, then the yard would have to prepare that as well. Uh, signal rules, pretty straightforward. Uh, you need to know what the little lights mean and what to do when you see them. Uh, again, I do a whole other clinic on signaling. If you want to check that out, it's on YouTube. It's Understanding Railroad Signals with Mike Roquet. I do a whole clinic on how to understand that and demystify the whole signal thing. Uh, but we put a cheat sheet up on the board so that folks don't have to do that necessarily. You can just refer to it quickly. Um, we have a job card for every job. Uh, what we do is we print it on little index cards and it gives you step-by-step -step instructions how to do your job. Look at that in just a second. Car cards and waybills. I don't think I have to describe that to this audience. Car cards are for each car and waybills for where we want them to go. We also place area maps around the layout so people know in say Oroville where each customer is and what each track's name is and so forth. And we also use station signs so that you know where you are and in our case, we tell you what's in either direction. So let's look at some of those. Let's look at the call board and the road train lineup. This is a shot of our whiteboard. This is right in the door when you walk in the club. You can see the call board here on the left. This is a magnetic whiteboard and we have name tags for all of our members who regularly attend operating sessions. The call bar just lists the essential jobs, dispatcher, yard master, yard switchers, and locals. Uh, all of these jobs begin at the start of the session or start at the beginning of the session. Um, some of them run for part of the session. Some of them are the entire session. So, for example, if you're a yard master, you're the yard master for the entire session. But if you run a local, if you finish your work, then you can jump in the road pool and maybe run some more trains if you like. Um, and not every job runs every session. Uh, typically, the dispatcher and the yard masters run every session, but depending on traffic needs and customer demand, we may annul um, various locals if needed. So you can see here the Oakland Pier turn was annulled and two other locals were annulled on this particular night for whatever reason. And then on the other side, we have the road train line. This is just a list of road trains that runs in a sequence. Um, <clears throat> basically, um, the color codes sort of represent either where the train goes or what type of train it is. And the real key to this is the three columns with these little magnetic pins that we use. The first column says annulled, the middle column says called, and the third column says crew. And what we do is at the beginning of the session, if I want a train to run, I will move the pin for it to called. 
And as the operators run each train, they the next train to run is the first train in the list who has a pin in the called column. And when a crew member crews a train, they move that pin over to crewed so that the next operator knows that, that train has been crewed and uh, what the next available road train might be. It also gives me the flexibility to annul road trains if necessary. Uh, but basically the crew member comes up, moves the pin over to crewed for the next train, grabs the job card and goes to work. Um, again, these all run in sequence. We don't run on a schedule. We don't use a fast clock. Uh, we find that one-to-one uh, -one time is, uh, is challenging enough. <laughs> and again, not all trains run uh, during every session. Usually we try to run everything in the road, but sometimes if, for example, a session doesn't finish or for whatever reason, a train doesn't need to run, we might annul it. So that's call board and the road train lineup. Here's our yard train departure sheet. Uh, I spent a fair amount of time developing the graphic design for this, but what it does is it lists all of trains, uh, all the trains or blocks that a yard has to make up uh, in order of how soon they depart. And um, some train, and here's the key with this, some trains may not depart until the next session, which is to say that this, uh, what I get a lot of questions about is, well, why don't you just use the road train lineup? And basically um, what the, Part of the way that we minimize staging, we'll talk about this, I think, a little bit, or I guess we'll talk about it as we go. Um, one of the ways that I can minimize staging is for the operating crews to essentially stage the railroad on the fly. In other words, what's the difference between staging and operating? Well, the real difference is whether you're doing it during a session or not, right? We're still talking about making up trains or moving cars around or, or classifying things or building an outbound train. So what what has worked well for us is to basically have the yards uh, classify and build new trains uh, through the session that won't begin until the uh, won't depart until the beginning of the next session, so that they're ready to go at the beginning of the session. Remember, our goals are to get everybody to work right away. So, if let's say you're on a train that you know, let's say for example, this Great Northern Manifest might be the first train to depart on the road train list. But if the yard hasn't made it up and you're on the crew for that, what do you do? You're going to end up just sitting there waiting for that to get built. Whereas if during the previous session, the yard has that train built and at the beginning of the session, it's powered up and ready to go, then we can put people to work right away. It also helps keep the yards moving, right? You get those trains out of there, keeps the yards, uh, you know, gives them as much working room as possible. Uh, so again, this is substantially different than the road train lineup because we essentially kind of split. We have the roughly the, the second half of what you see on the yard departure sheet is the yards preparing the trains that will run at the beginning of the next session. Now you found that to be a, a really key way to uh, make things fun. So that's the yard train departure sheet. I can drill into this a little bit. Um, you can see that, so for example, the Ketty turn, this is a local that comes into 12th Street and uh, this train needs its Oroville block to be at the front of the train and the Ketty block to be at the rear. I'm sorry, the other way around. This train goes east, Ketty block at the head, and then the Oroville's at the rear. So the Oroville's include OV, which is Oroville, and MV, which is Marysville. That's that other little branch line coming off of Oroville. And the parentheses denote the maximum number of cars for that block. So what this says is put the Ketty block at the east end. And that can be Keddies, Renos, Quincy's, or Poe cars. And then the Oroville's go behind that with a maximum of five for Oroville and three for Marysville. And that's how we limit the number of inbound cars to Oroville, which is tight. There's a lot of customers, but obviously capacity is not unlimited. So by minimizing or, or limiting the uh, number of cars going there at any one time to eight per session, it tends to prevent Oroville from getting clogged and overloaded. And I've had to tweak that number over the years. It used to be a little bit higher, but I found this to be the optimal number after years of sort of trial and error. Um, same thing with the West Oakland turn. You can see he's got a West Oakland block, which includes Marysville's and West Oakland's, and then the Davis block, which includes only Davis. Uh, same thing for these road trains. These are pretty straightforward. They only take one sort of uh, one block of cars, but uh, these you can see for an eastbound train, the engine has to be on the eastbound end or see the east side, east end. The caboose goes on the west end. And for this Oakland train, which is west of Sacramento, his engine would be on the west end on the front, the caboose on the, on the east side. Uh, I think that's pretty straightforward. It makes a lot of sense. But I found that this uh, works really well. Oh, and the maximum number of cars here. You can see that the Ketty turn is limited to 18 cars. And the reason for that is that allows him to guarantee that he'll pick up at least six cars at Oroville if necessary. Let's say there's four to go out, he'll be all set. If there's 10, well, he may be able to pick up more if there aren't eight Orvilles and Marysvilles, or he may not have that many Ketties or so forth. But if we limit it to 18, we can guarantee that he'll be able to take at least six 
out of Oroville. And we found that to work pretty well. The West Oakland turn on the other hand is limited to 10 cars. And the short story behind that is because where he ties up uh, in West Oakland, uh, it's, uh, it's a short siding. So we've got to make sure that he can fit in the clear there. Um, these other trains uh, are two basically eastbound haulers that go to Keddy. They take 18 so that they can pick up any great northerns or Salt Lake cities in Keddy. They can pick up up to six. And the Oakland hauler terminates in Oakland so he can take the the railroad maximum of 24. So I found this form works really well. It communicates a lot of information in a compact and I'd like to think easy to understand way. Um, so that's our train departure sheet. Signal rules, this is pretty straightforward. This is uh, kind of like a signal rules page out of your rule book for our model railroad. Um, it basically just lists all the signal aspects, which are what they look like. So you can see here for clear, for example, that's a green over red over red on a, on a searchlight signal or a green over green on a semaphore. This advanced approach is flashing yellow and so on and so forth. Those are the aspects. That's what the signal looks like. And then on the right side, we have the indications, which are what you do. Uh, each signal has a name or let's say each aspect has a name. So green is clear, yellow is approach, red is stop, so on and so forth. And then when you see that, what do you do? Well, if you see approach diverging, proceed prepared to pass the next signal not exceeding the prescribed speed through turnout. Uh, basically means you're gonna diverge at the next signal essentially and take the appropriate speed and so forth. So it's kind of a cheat sheet. Uh, we don't have to do the whole clinic for it. You can just refer to this uh, quickly when you're operating. It's always right up on the board in a prominent area. And it also works well for conversation when you're not in a session. People say, oh, I saw that signal. What did that mean? Or tell me about this. It works great uh, having it up and visible at all times so people can sort of uh, ask questions or, or study up in between sessions, that sort of thing. Job card. Uh, these are the cards I talked about. Every job gets one of these. This is a uh, uh, just a small index card. Uh, I guess it's a four by six index card, I think, uh, aligned portrait vertically. Uh, it has the name of the job and where it originates or where to go. And then it's literally step by step instructions on uh, what I have found to be the most efficient way to get the job done. Um, and the key here is that these instructions assume that the operator has never done this job before. Uh, we always have to assume a certain minimum level of knowledge, right? You know what a train is, you know what a throttle is, you know what an operating session is. But um, even if you've never been to our layout before, you've never been to an operating session before, um, you know, uh, we try to write the instructions in a way that anybody can just pick up and, and run that job. Uh, you can see it's just a numbered list of instructions, you know, uh, go here, do this, call the dispatcher, you know, follow the signals, little uh, tips on maximum train length, uh, you know, requirements, uh, some little tips on sometimes how to get jobs done a little bit better, you know, do this this way and move this way. But generally, we try to make the instructions declarative. We say, this is what you need to do. In other words, we tell you what to do, not necessarily how to do it. Right. If I tell you proceed to Oroville siding on signal indication, well, wait for the signal and go. Um, you know, pick up the westbound cars. Well, do I work this customer first, that customer first? How do I do it? That's what you've got to figure out. That's the whole fun of an op session, right? Is how to how to actually do it. We just tell you the what, and your job is to figure out the how. But if you've got the what, usually the how is pretty pretty easy. Um, and these can be double sided. We've been able to fit all the even the complicated jobs. Uh, on two sides on one card, so we can keep it to one card for per each job. Car cards and waybills. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. I think you folks know what we're talking about here. The card, which is the outer part here, represents the car. So in this case, it's the uh, Sierra Central 52018. You can see the reporting marks are on the card, and then we have a waybill in this case to San Francisco Bay Area, which is essentially Oakland. Um, we use generally two destination or two cycle cards. I find that a lot easier as far as managing traffic flows. Four cycle cards introduce a lot of randomness into what cars go where at any given time, whereas sort of two, st uh, two destinations, it's either going from staging to the layout or from the layout to staging. We do have some uh, single line haul, you know, uh, pick up on the layout, you know, and deliver to another customer on the layout. But the vast majority of stuff is coming in from the outside or coming in, uh, going out from the inside. Um, and then we also have empty cars. Uh, so if we have no way built, 
Uh, that's an empty car that's free to be confiscated by the 12th Street Yardmaster, and they can be reassigned uh, with waybills that we keep in a binder. We use little plastic sheet protectors. The Yardmaster can use that binder to reassign those cars, and that provides a little bit of randomness to the traffic flow. So you don't see the same cars going at the same customers all the time. Um, so car cards and waybills, pretty straightforward. Um, here's one of our area maps for the Quincy branch shows you where you are. So, so this is side of a station sign and an area map, but the station sign says Quincy and it tells you which way is east and west. And then of course, where each customer is and in some cases what each track is, that sort of thing. Um, it identifies all the customers and tracks and spots in, in a particular area. And every track has a unique name. Um, that's sort of for the LDC guys, I guess, but uh, give every track a name. And then whenever you tell uh, a crew to spot a car on a particular track or a customer, um, there's no ambiguity there. That's sort of key to that as well. Um, here's a station sign at Davis, same, same idea. Uh, we've got the Southern Pacific logo because it's an SP territory and we use the Southern Pacific's design, but it identifies a station. And in this case, this is a passenger depot, but when we say station, of course, we mean a named location on the railroad. In this case, it's Davis. Um, and it also tells you east and west uh, because that uh, actually changes because we don't have a helix. So on the upper deck to the left would be east, on the lower deck to the left would be west. Um, so cardinal directions are also important in our case. <clears throat> so let's talk about some train types. Let's talk about exactly what, um, how to really think about an operating session or, or just generally how railroads move stuff and how they break down the work into various train types. Um, again, you can see here at Martinez, uh, our CTC signals, this uh, San Joaquin Daylight is getting a uh, diverging clear here to cross over in front of uh, what appears to be a westbound freight block for Oakland. So there's basically five types of trains, essentially, on, on any railroad. Right? We've got a yard switcher, which sorts incoming cars and builds new trains at yards. We have a local that delivers cars between customers and a yard or an interchange. Uh, we have a hauler or a manifest. These are trains that transport blocks of cars between yards. These are your road trains, let's say, your road freights. And uh, passenger trains, pretty straightforward, local and long distance passenger service in our case. And then we've got specials. Uh, work trains, officer specials, uh, equipment repositioning, light power, that sort of thing. Something that isn't, you know, sort of making money or hauling passengers, right? Some kind of special move we've got to make for an unusual or let's say non-revenue non reason, right? Um, so those are the types. Let's talk about the actual jobs that we're talking about. Again, here's Davis with the Shasta Daylight showing up. Um, kind of a key scene and a uh, fun spot on our layout. <clears throat> so the call board jobs <clears throat> are basically the dispatchers and the yard jobs. Uh, our dispatcher uh, operates our CTC panel. We have, uh, we're still restoring our actual CTC machine. So we're not actually dispatching with the machine yet, but we do have a full CTC implementation uh, in JMRI. So we use JMRI and uh, Panel Pro to show on the screen a digital representation of a lever machine. And the dispatcher uses that and a FRS radio to communicate with crews and grant authority uh, through signal indication and just manage uh, train departures. You know, when the train departs a yard, typically the dispatcher, the uh, yard master, excuse me, will call a dispatcher and, hey, we've got the Oakland Manifest ready to go and you can take them or what have you. Uh, 12th Street Yard Masters, kind of the, the head honcho on the layout. That's probably the most difficult job after the dispatcher. The yard master manages uh, trains coming in and out of the yard and coordinates between the two switcher jobs that we see for job number three there. And then the Caddy yard master is kind of a footboard yard master. Uh, it's the only person up there is the yard master also switches the yard. <clears throat> and then we've got um, a number of locals. We've got the Caddy switcher, uh, which basically comes out of Caddy and switches the nearby towns of Reno. And uh, right now is, uh, this is actually out of date, well, up until right now, used to run the um, Quincy branch but we've now split that off as, it's not really the Quincy branch, it's the Quincy Railroad. So we've kind of split that off as a separate job, but Ketty Switcher is kind of the local switcher in Ketty. Oroville uh, works all of the customers in Oroville, same kind of same kind of deal. We've got a lot of fruit packing and um, timber, that sort of thing going out. So there's a lot of customers, uh, you know, the small number of spots, large number of, excuse me, large number of spots, small number of cars, that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> Marysville's uh, sort of a, a short branch line turn, the R Street turn, is heavy switching in our street, as we saw. In fact, let me, uh, I'll show you here in just a second. Um, the Oakland Pier turn and the Ketty turn are kind of the east and west 
um, uh, peddlers, uh, the Oakland Pier turn starts out, or excuse me, the, uh, the West Oakland turn and the Ketty turn. The, uh, the Oakland Pier turn is also a turn that runs from Oakland Pier to Sacramento and back. And it's kind of the hot traffic going to the pier and the Ketty turn and the West Oakland turn run respectively from the east and west ends of the railroad to Sacramento in the middle and then back out. <clears throat> So again, here's our track plan. Uh, again, you can see, you know, Oakland Desert Yard here is our west end staging. All of the eastbound trains, uh, the road trains will originate there and they all run from Oakland to Sacramento. They're all kind of haulers and forwarders. Uh, the West Oakland job goes on duty here at West Oakland. He works West Oakland, works Martinez, goes all the way around, all the way to Sacramento, drops off everything, picks up the uh, Davis is Martinez in West Oakland, comes back, works Davis, and then ties up at West Oakland. Same thing up here on the top deck. Keddy turn starts at Keddy, comes out, works Poe, works Oroville, and goes down to 12th Street, turns, comes back, and ties up at Keddy Yard. <clears throat> Our street switches all of these customers. Um, you, know, you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 spots which uh, if you've got any experience <clears throat> operating at all is a lot. But uh, I think that's a pretty good overview of that. Um, we can dig into the details, but we only have about an hour here. So let's just go over the road trains and that's about it. Um, basically, we've got a passenger train eastbound and westbound. We've got the California Zephyr, which is a WP train. The Shasta Daylight uh, is a uh, SP train. Uh, we've got the Oakland hauler and the uh, Sacramento Manifest West, which kind of are east and westbound haulers. The Senator and the El Dorado were the Southern Pacific's, um, you know, local passenger trains between Oakland and 12th Street or Oakland and Sacramento, excuse me. Um, Caddy Special is a train that we run um, optionally during the session if I want to throw a work train in or an office car special or what we really intended to use it for was for members to bring a special train. In other words, one member gets to bring one train every session that gets to run during the session as part of our session. So if you, <clears throat> if you model the uh, 1960 era, you can bring a special train and we will run it during the op session. You may not be the one who runs it, but it adds some variety and some stuff. So uh, like we run a, an early van train on the WP or somebody might have a work train or what have you. Um, and then the Oakland Manifest is kind of the special train because it's the only train that starts in Keddy. It's the only train that doesn't start uh, or end in 12th Street. It actually runs the whole railroad from Keddy on the east end, stops at 12th Street with hot, uh, just picks up Oakland cars and then continues on to Oakland. And then uh, eastbound is kind of the, the uh, uh, excuse me, the, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I've drawn a blank on the word, the, the, uh, corresponding trains to those westbounds, so Zephyr East, the Daylight East, that sort of thing. Um, and then we have those two Great Northern and Salt Lake City Manifests. Those trains only run east. They basically have a combined counterpart in the Sacramento Manifest West. And um, to make a long story short, I don't have time to get into the details of it, but when you look at all of this and it all runs together, there's an equal number of trains that run east and west. So we never have to run like power. We never have to rebalance anything. If everything runs, or if we annul a train, we annul its uh, counterpart, then we never have to rebalance motive power. Again, less staging, less work between sessions, more fun, right? Um, so those are our road trains. And again, more uh, of a layout overview to uh, get some context on all that. But I think that's about it. Um, I, I think to just sum it up, uh, in the years that I've been running with all this stuff, it has gotten much easier, much more fun. We've recruited many, many new members. I think we had an open house a few weeks ago where we recruited 10 or 15 new members. And uh, a lot of our members come in for our operating sessions that are open to um, non-members. It's a recruiting tool for us. So keeping up simple and light and minimizing staging and having fun and addressing those challenges and having good job aids and just a variety of different jobs of different skill levels has really worked out for us well. For me personally, I enjoy operating uh, as sort of the core to the hobby. We're, we're fortunate to have CTC and a, and a big uh, club size layout. It's been a lot of fun for me. And uh, if uh, you have any questions about any of this, uh, feel free to let me know. It looks like we have some questions in the chat. So that's all I've got. Do you want me to read those questions or you want to read them off, Eric? How should we go? Well, I'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and read them off. Um, sure. So there's a comment from Ken Cameron. I've always liked having trains out in the line at the start of the session on some layouts. This is because that's where they were when the clock stopped. Mm -hmm. Other layouts would seed some of them, but the idea was that those train crews would be able to go right to work. 
Same concept towards the end of the session. Last train on the layout doesn't race to the yard <laughs> because nobody's left. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it isn't the only train still out so yeah uh, no that's a great comment i'll address it quickly um perfect example is our west oakland turn we get a lot of questions about well if it starts in west oakland shouldn't it be the sacramento turn uh what we actually do is it, it does originate in 12th street uh but imagine if that job got to west oakland and died on the law and then at the next session you're starting out sort of mid job and then you end at 12th street and then of course start again and go to west oakland we do that very thing with locals and sometimes we do leave road trains out there but for us we need to have the main tracks clear because between sessions we have a lot of casual running so we can't really have trains sitting on the main for a month between sessions but we do do it with the locals great yeah comment. i was going to say clubs you, you've always got to keep that main line open for people That's right. to come down especially if it's one where they can come in any time you know with a key or whatever so yeah uh, there's a couple of questions about age range of your club operators. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, average age and number. Uh, yeah, let me try and address all of that. Um, we have a wide variety of age and number of operators per session. We have operators as young as, I think, 14 or 15. We have some junior members and we have some members who are over 70 and everything in between. Uh, like most model railroad clubs, I would say that our uh, age tends to skew older, but we do have a lot of young guys who really balance out the average, myself included. Uh, I'm 40, I'm sort of right in the middle, but we have guys as young as 14 and as old as I think 80 something. I think we've got some. Yeah, guys. even at uh, 51, I still tend to bring down the age average at, at some of the events I go to. So Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a question about how do you define restricted or prescribed speeds for signaling? Mm. Well, again, I do a whole clinic on that called Understanding Railroad Signals, but let me just pick it apart a little bit. Restricted speed is not a particular speed. It's not 15 miles an hour. Restricted speed basically means being able to stop within half of your line of sight. So if you imagine two trains approaching each other, if they can both stop within as half as far as they can see, they'll never collide, right? So restricted speed is a method of operation. It's not a particular velocity. Um, now, when you talk about prescribed speeds, uh, we talk about, uh, you know, route signaling here in the West, as opposed to speed signaling rules in the East, where, you know, you might get something in the East that would say uh, medium clear, which would be, say, red over green, and basically means proceed through the diverging route at no faster than 30 miles an hour, medium speed. That's a speed that's defined, and the signal indication is do not exceed that speed. In the West, we typically use what's called route signaling, where uh, the engineer is essentially uh, expected to know what that proper speed is. And you're thinking, well, how do you remember every crossover on hundreds of miles of territory? Most of them are the same speed. Nowadays, most of them are good for 40. Some of them are good for more than that. Um, but when we talk about the prescribed speed in a model railroading context, it basically means if you're diverging, don't go blasting through at maximum authorized speed. Slow it down for crossing over so that it looks realistic and we're actually operating in a, in a realistic way. That's what we mean by prescribed speed, you know, diverge at a reasonable speed for diverging. Um, are you guys still uh, building the layout or is it uh, basically done and strictly used for operations now? It sounds like you allow at least open running as most clubs would. Are you still building on the layout there? Uh, yeah, I, we're, we're not finished. Uh, the layout construction is primarily done. I mean, this railroad is about 20 years old. We started building this in, in uh, 2000. Uh, it's funny because this is our new layout. We had a layout before that for, for uh, some years. But um, we, as I mentioned in uh, like Reno up here, sorry. Um, just make this go away. Uh, Reno, we're changing over to Crescent Mills. So we've got some scenery work to do there and some, some uh, track changes, some minor stuff to do. Um, we're also completing the signaling. We don't have signals uh, everywhere. So for example, here on the east end of Sacramento 12th Street, we're adding a control point there that hasn't been signaled yet. And there's a few other ones. The entire upper deck is pretty much signaled, but uh, the lower deck has some signaling work to be done. And there's a variety of just scenery projects, little projects here and there. Uh, for example, up here in Ketty Yard, there's, there's no scenery there at all. We're starting the roundhouse now. So I would say we're about Oh, I don't know, maybe 65, let's say 70% complete as far as fully scenic, fully done, uh, signaled, but there's still plenty of work to be done. So we've got operations, but we've still got plenty of uh, opportunity for scenery and construction work to be done. All right. 
Yeah. It looks like there's at least one person in interest in hearing uh, your presentation on signals. Maybe we can do that uh, next quarter. Uh, sure, yeah. Be um, interested in presenting it. Sure, I would, I'd be happy to do that. Although again, you can, you can find it on YouTube. If you give me just one second, what I'll do is I'll, I'll post, here's a link to my website in the chat. And I'll see if I can grab the YouTube link here really quickly. Um, okay. Can actually, I, yeah. I forgot that you'd put it up on YouTube. Yeah, that's that's yeah. even easier. <laughs> yeah, here's the here's the YouTube link in the chat. So um, yeah, take a look at that article. The article I actually didn't write. I, I got it from a guy named, I think it was A.A. A. Krug, who I've never met, but apparently um, you know, he was sort of the guy. He had written this article on his website, and I had just kept a copy for my own personal reference. I learned a great deal from it. And then uh, like in 2016, it just disappeared from the internet. His website went down and uh, mm. the guy's been sort of, you know, uh, AWOL and so, uh, or MIA, I should say. And uh, so I basically reposted it on my blog. And, uh, you know, again, it's been an interest of mine since my childhood in New York City on the subway. I, I was always fascinated by, you know, how do they keep all those trains moving safely and efficiently? And what do all the lights mean? And how does the motorman or engineer know what to do? Um, so I've kind of taken over that article and um, I used that as the basis for my railroad signals clinic, which I've been doing for, I don't know, five or six years now, I guess since 2016 or so. Um, and that's what you'll see in the video. It's about, I think we ended up going two hours. I uh, was there with uh, John Abaticola over at TSG Multimedia, who, shameless plug, excellent yep. guy, excellent stuff. You guys probably already know who I'm talking about. But uh, he had me on to do the video, and uh, I was able to put it on YouTube and uh, get him some traffic and some content and uh, have somewhere to send folks uh, on days like today. So do read the article. Do check out the video. And if you have any questions, just reach out to me. I'm on Facebook. I'm at the club. If you're here in Sacramento, or the Bay Area, you probably already know me, but uh, you know, stop on by. We have open houses usually in the spring. We have ops once a month on the first Friday. We have sort of a fun run on the third Friday. We're open Tuesdays and Fridays, seven to ten. Uh, so come on down. We're right here in Sacramento. All righty. Well, that answers uh, Brad's question about how often you're operating, at least once uh, once a month. It sounds like so. Once a month for proto ops, yeah. Then we have occasionally uh, we have guest operating sessions. So about once a year, if you're a member of the um, Sierra Division and MRA, they come in for an operating session about once a year. We host that just as a courtesy. We're happy to have them. They're great operators. Uh, also the um, uh, the Pacific Coast region, we have an op session for them usually once a year, about uh, March or so in the spring, something like that. Um, if you're a member, you guys of get in with the uh, Bay Area ops group that uh, Seth Newman runs or is I don't remember how far Sacramento is it's a little bit of, a <laughs> little bit far from Bay Area but it's further than you think that's uh that's if you're not from California uh, you may think things are a lot closer Sac San Francisco well, is about 80 miles from Sacramento it's it's about okay. an hour and a half <laughs> away so no we have never been part of bay rails or the uh the bay area ld sig op sig meet although i have gone there a number of times and i will shamelessly plug that as well uh yeah, if you're into yeah. operating if you're into layout design there are some fantastic layouts there are some amazing uh modelers uh who have a lot of wisdom and a lot of skill and just a lot of great people to be around so if you've never been to one of those uh by all means get there it's it's worth coming out here for it's a little tough now with covid i think they're doing it virtually this year but there are some really you know uh world class layouts in the bay area so yeah, we have I mean, not been part of that but informally we we do have a connection to the bay area it's kind of nearby for us so there's a lot of folks yeah. we have folks actually that come up from the bay area for our operating sessions and we've been down to the carquinez club and some of the other local clubs there so uh yeah we're uh, we're close enough to be friends but far enough that it's <laughs> hard to drive you know but yeah, yeah we're, yeah, we're involved. Yeah, lived in I lived in uh, San, near San Mateo for a couple of years back, several decades ago, but uh, <laughs> never quite made it up to San Sacramento. So, uh -huh. all right. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording here.